You've already done simple distillation. In fact, I think you did it several times. What we're going to do in this laboratory is do what's called a vacuum distillation. And we're going to look and see what is a fractional distillation and what is a steam distillation. Simple distillation is where you take a compound and you boil it and then collect it at a cooler temperature um, and uh, it drips over. You know how to do this. You've used this setup where you boil here. Notice where your thermometer is quite low so it will get hot in the vapors and then the vapors flow over here and condense in the condenser and then it drips out. So you're familiar with this. You can plot the temperature of what you're boiling versus how much will come through. And notice that if, uh, let's say you have two components and you're separating, as you start distilling, uh, nothing uh, or very little is collect, not nothing, but the temperature stays steady and until uh, most of the first thing. Okay, two components can be separated and usually one is the compound you want and the other one is an impurity. And uh, what I want to point out to you, this is volume of the distillate collected and this is the temperature. The distillate is what you have on the other side. The distillate is what is in the pot that's being uh, distilled. If you uh, look as the volume, it will uh, you'll when you have just pure component coming over, the volume uh, increases as the temperature remains steady. But as the component one decreases, your temperature gradually increases until you get to the boiling point uh, of the second component. And uh, so that's why we can separate them is we basically take a fraction. We might take a fraction here discard this and take a fraction there and then we have a not perfectly separated components this is like ideal here normally it's kind of like there's uh, some slope to these lines in here when we do it in the lab but um, if the the boiling points of these are far enough apart we can separate them uh, and there is this distillation curve that uh, that we use to analyze the temperature and the composition. I'm not going to expect you to understand this. Um, it just really, this is experimentally determined, the lines here, and we're able to correlate a percentage with a temperature of the distillin, that's what's in the pot, with the uh, temperature of the condensate on the thermometer, and it will tell us exactly what the percentage of your distillate is. Um, I'm not going to go into this for you. You can skip over this and drawing the fractional distillation uh, concept on the distillation mat. What I want to go to is what you're going to be doing, which is a vacuum distillation. In vacuum distillation, you use reduced pressure to distill a compound. Why do we use reduced pressure? Because when we apply a vacuum to something that is boiling, it reduces its boiling point. This is used for compounds that are sensitive to heat or often to air because if you evacuate the inside of a distillation apparatus and keep it under vacuum, then there's very little air in there to react with a compound that might be air sensitive. We will often, well almost always, use it for compounds with a high boiling point, one above 200 degrees Celsius because almost all compounds will start to do some decomposition when they get that hot. Um, one of the sources of a vacuum is an aspirator. We also can use a vacuum pump that has oil as the uh, basis for pulling a, a vacuum. With an aspirator we're using water which is cheap and uh, the vacuum is all dependent on the vapor pressure of the water. So if you have hot water, you have a high vapor pressure, and so you get a very weak vacuum. And if you have cold water, you have a stronger, lower vapor pressure, and so a stronger vacuum. Um, 
you also have to have sufficient water pressure, which you all know we have very little of in our lab, but we will uh, be attempting to do uh, the vacuum distillation with what we have. And what we find is that um, we can find enough if I double you up on the aspirators that work pretty well, then we can get you to be able to do a vacuum distillation. But aspirators are really cheap. You can actually put one in your house if you have a reason to do some sucking, uh, like maybe pumping water out of an aquarium or something like that. And it's a cheap, easy way to pull a vacuum on something. Um, aspirators are not, do not pull that strong a vac vacuum. Uh, the pressure that you have with them is above that of the vapor pressure in water, and then you have leaks. Your distillation system can leak, and the aspirator is not perfect. And then, of course, water pressure can cause, uh, lack of water pressure can cause a problem, as we find. Um, the standard is that you use a trap with aspirators because they can back up and then water start flowing into your distillation apparatus or into something that you uh, do not want it to flow into. Our aspirators are weak enough. We rarely have that problem. Uh, if you want to use a trap, I will provide one to you. This is a vacuum distillation setup for when you have a really strong vacuum. We're not going to use the setup. We're just we're going to use the same thing as a simple distillation setup, but we're going to attach a vacuum home uh, hose. Uh, if you have a really strong vacuum, you have this little tube in there in which you have a way to control airflow up here. You might have uh, a hose and a pinch valve on it. And here, if you, your vacuum's getting too low, what you can do is start leaking air into the system so as to control your pressure. Um, and then, of course, you have what's called a Clayson head that allows two things to be attached here. We're going to skip this part right here, and we're going to just put the distill, uh, distillation head directly into the round bottom. And, of course, you'll need a thermometer and the thermometer adapter. And then down we go into the, the uh, condenser and the, the vacuum arm. And then you have to put a round bottom on the bottom. Now on this, you're going to want to use some uh, vacuum grease in your joints. And what you do is you only go halfway on each of these joints. And then as you put your two pieces of glassware together, you rub it back and forth. And it spreads it out and causes a good seal. That's to, to reduce the leakage of air into the system. You put a vacuum hose on here. And what's shown here is a trap. And they have a, on here a little device to help control uh, the vacuum. Usually what it is is you have it come in like this and you just have one hose coming out the top. And when if you're watching, you would see that it's starting to back up and you would take uh, means to make that stop. Okay? And then attached to this right here is a manometer. We're not going to be using a manometer. We don't have mercury manometers anymore. Uh, due to the health risk of mercury being spilled, uh, we're going to estimate our vapor pressure uh, in, based on some other means. Okay, so we're not going to use a man manometer to measure the vacuum that we're pulling. You can estimate it from the water uh, temperature and that would be the ideal, well, if you add uh, five millimeters of mercury to that, uh, the vapor pressure of water at its particular temperature, that's an estimate for what the aspirator is pulling. Doesn't quite work with us because we don't have great water pressure. To find the vapor pressure of 
water at particular temp temperatures. Look on page 785 of table E4, uh, E4 on page 785 of your laboratory textbook. Here's a chart for it, and you can see that as the temperature reduces, the vapor pressure of water starts reducing. And notice it says add 5 torr, which is millimeters of mercury, to whatever pressure the, va uh, the vapor pressure of water is. That's the, the lowest you possibly could get in an aspirator. There's another way to get a vacuum, and that is to use a vacuum pump. It has oil in uh, the system that has a much higher vapor pressure, and so you're able to uh, get a much lower pressure. It all depends on the efficiency of the pump. You can pull an incredibly low pressure, and because it's an electronic machine running at a steady rate, you get a steady pressure. But they're very expensive, and they, re they can be dangerous. Um, why is boiling point reduced by a vacuum? Well, at boiling, the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So why does water boil at 100 degrees Celsius? It's because at 100 degrees Celsius, its vapor pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. So what if I lower the pressure to 300 millimeters of mercury? Well, water doesn't have to put as much vapor pressure out in order to match that ap atmospheric pressure and push up against the atmosphere. So the temperature demand is much lower, and you would find that the boiling point of water might be seven, uh, 70 or 60 degrees at that point. So through the reduction of the atmospheric pressure, your vapor pressure requirement is reduced, and so the temperature required to boil is reduced, and you distill at a lower temperature. Vacuum distillation does have its problems. The most important problem is that you can get bumping, even when you use boiling chips. If you can use a stir bar, it's better because the stir bars actually will break up bubbles, uh, but uh, you use whatever you have to in a particular circumstance. Variable pressure can cause your temperature to go up and down, and you might observe that. And you must have glassware that doesn't have cracks or what are called stars, as a, a defect like that can cause a, a, an implosion, which can be dangerous. Um, when we are looking at the boiling point of a compound under vacuum, Let's say I want to know what the boiling point of something is at a particular uh, vacuum, and I know the normal boiling point. Or I want to know what my vacuum is because I have an observed boiling point under vacuum and the normal boiling point. Well, you can use this thing called a nomograph to relate the normal boiling point and a reduced pressure boiling point. Remember that normal boiling point is the boiling point at 760 millimeters of mercury. Here is an example. Uh, what is the boiling point of water at 30 torr? The normal boiling point is 100 degrees and the pressure is 30 torr. So you go to the nomograph. You place your ruler at 100 degrees on the normal boiling point. Uh, column or rule, and then you go to the pressure scale and you put 30 torr. And what you would find is that it lands at about 12 degrees Celsius. And you might want to turn to the nomograph in your book and try this out to make sure you know how to do this. Uh, you can also figure out the normal boiling point of an unknown compound in the same way. If it is uh, distilling at 80 degrees Celsius and you have 10 millimeters of pressure, you can work backwards to the normal boiling point. 